everyone, and welcome to today's Journal Club. I'm Arthur Xu, Editorial Fellow for the International Journal of Gynecological Cancer. So um, I'd like to thank ESGO and IGCS for their support in transitioning our Journal Club to a virtual format. Before we begin, I want to mention a few housekeeping notes relevant to the Zoom platform for today's Journal Club. We're recording today's discussion, and the recording will be made publicly available. Participants with cameras turned on may appear in the video recording. We ask that everyone please keep your microphones muted so everyone can hear the presentations. If you're having any difficulties or questions, please send a message in chat and our technical support will assist. We'll have time for Q&A and encourage you to submit questions via the chat function throughout today's session. And with that, I'm pleased to turn it over to Dr. Pedro Ramirez, Editor-in-Chief of the International Journal of Gynecological Cancer, who will introduce today's article and discuss it. Hi, Peter, you're mute. Um, Sorry. I was just mentioning thank you, Arthur, and thanks everybody for uh, joining in. I, uh, obviously, I'm joining in from uh, the operating room in between cases. And uh, it, it looks like we have to work on our on our hacking uh, 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 protection mechanism. Uh, so we will hopefully uh, have that addressed soon. Welcome to all of the new fellows that we have uh, now in the journal: Natalia Rodriguez, Sarah Nasser, uh, Erika Estrada, Emma Allison, and uh, Ceci Darin. And thank you uh, to all of the previous fellows who are joining in as well. So this is, uh, again, an exciting uh, journal club. We're looking forward to, um, to this discussion. Um, this is on the title of uh, Rucaparib Maintenance Treatment for Recurrent Ovarian Cancer, the Effects of Progression-Free Interval and Prior Therapies on Efficacy and Safety in the Randomized uh, Phase Three Trial, Aerial 3. Um, very pleased to have uh, Andrew Klemp, uh, who is uh, joining us, um, obviously author, lead author of the manuscript, and we're lo really looking forward to, uh, to his discussion. Um, I believe that we have two questions that we would like for the audience to just uh, take before the uh, discussion begins. So Arthur, I'll let you um, uh, proceed with, uh, with the questions. Yes, so um, we'd like to have two polls for everyone to participate. And for the first poll, and can we put up the poll? So uh, for Rucaparib, uh, extended progression-free survival versus placebo is regardless of uh, penultimate progression-free interval number of lines of pure chemotherapies, bevacizumab use for all of the above in recurrent ovarian cancer. So we'd like to know uh, your thoughts. So waiting for everyone's uh, answers. All right. All right. Yeah. Can we um, show our uh, results? So, uh, five percent agrees with the penalty made progression free interval. Five percent was number of lines of pre chemotherapies. Sixteen percent was bevacizumab use, and seventy four percent was of the above. And now. For our uh, second uh, poll. So the second poll is in, in recurrent ovarian cancer, safety was similar between recuperative treated patients across all subgroups, even in patients who are heavily pre-treated and or have more rapid disease recurrence. Yes or no? All right, um, so uh, can we have our results? And so 94% agrees that uh, safety was similar between groups. 
Yes. So. Uh, all right. Very well. Thank you, Arthur. So now we'll introduce uh, um, uh, Dr. Clamp, uh, who will give us a brief overview of the results of the study. Andrew. Hi. Thank you, Pedro. Um, Arthur, are you able to project my slide, please? Yes. Fantastic. So, so thank you, Pedro and Arthur, for inviting me to the Journal Club on behalf of the Aerial 3 investigators to present um, the headline uh, results from our exploratory subgroup analysis of the Aerial 3 uh, trial. If I could have my next slide, uh, please. So for background, I'd just like to remind you of, of the uh, design um, and uh, primary outcome uh, from the Pivotable Aerial 3 trial that led to the licensing of Recaprib for maintenance treatment of platinum sensitive ovarian uh, cancer. 564 women with high grade serous or endometrioid ovarian primary or fallopian tube cancers entered the trial. They had to have disease that was sensitive to their penultimate platinum based treatment and had to have responded to their most uh, recent uh, platinum uh, therapy radiologically and have a CA125 within the normal range at the end of treatment. Patients needed to have an equal performance status of 0 to 1 and no prior PARP inhibitor um, exposure. They were randomized in a two to one ratio to receive maintenance recapro at a dose of 600 milligrams twice daily or uh, matched uh, placebo. If I could have the next slide, uh, please. The primary outcome measure was investigator assessed progression free survival. And this was analyzed in a hierarchical uh, fashion, looking at three um, subgroups in a stepwise fashion, initially in patients who had uh, BRCA uh, mutated high grade ovarian cancer, and the Kaplan Meier curve for that population is given on the lower uh, left as A. And as you can see, there was a substantial uh, benefit from maintenance recovery with a hazard ratio of 0.23, favoring this um, over placebo. A second stepwise analysis was then done in the subgroup of patients who had homologous recombination deficient disease, which included those that were BRCA mutant. And again, as you can see from the middle Kaplan-Meier curve, um, there was a significant improvement in progression-free survival, the hazard ratio of 0.32 uh, favoring uh, recaprib. The final analysis was done in the whole intention to treat uh, population. And again, there was a clinically uh, significant benefit from recaprib with an improvement in um, median progression free survival with a hazard ratio of 0.36 uh, in favor of uh, recaprib. If we could move on to the next slide, please, um, Arthur. In this study, we did um, exploratory subgroup analyses looking um, at clinical characteristics um, associated with prior. Uh, therapy uh, for women who entered into the Aerial 3 trial. The three subgroups that we looked at were, or characteristics that we looked at, were the progression-free interval following their penultimate platinum uh, prior to entry into the trial. And this was a pre-planned subgroup analysis. And we divided this into two subgroups. Those patients who had a, a PFI of uh, six to less than or equal to 12 months, and those that had a, a PFI of greater than 12 months. The second analyses uh, would done uh, based on the number of prior chemotherapy uh, regimens and patients were divided up into those that had two uh, regimens or those that had three or more prior uh, chemotherapy uh, regimens. And then the final analysis was done in the group, uh, was, was done based on whether patients had received prior uh, bevacizumab therapy, yes or no. Two analyses were performed. We looked at the um, primary um, outcome measure of progression-free survival and this was done using the database uh, from the primary publication, um, which was locked in April uh, 2017. And then secondly, we looked at uh, safety to see whether the different uh, safety uh, profile was seen in these groups. But that was done on um, a, a database which had which was locked in December uh, 2019. So there was two and a half years um, additional follow up uh, for safety compared uh, to progression free survival. If I could have the next slide, uh, please. And so this is a summary of uh, the progression free survival 
uh, results. And effectively, the conclusion is that recaparib maintenance treatment significantly improves progression-free survival against placebo across all subgroups based on progression-free interval and prior therapy C. So the Kaplan-Meier curves uh, for patients subdivided by progression-free interval is on uh, the left-hand side, and as you can see, hazard ratios favoring recaparib are similar, irrespective of whether the progression-free interval was six to 12 months or greater than 12 months. The middle two Kaplan-Meier curves um, are looking at prior chemotherapy regimens. The patients that had two prior chemotherapy regimens um, in the top uh, Kaplan-Meier and those that had three or more um, in, in the bottom Kaplan-Meier. And again, as you can see, similar hazard uh, ratios in favor of recaparib. And then on the right, we have the Kaplan-Meier curves dependent on prior or no prior bevacizumab uh, use with, again, similar hazard ratios in favour of recaparib, um, irrespective of whether the patient received bevacizumab or um, did not uh, receive uh, bevacizumab. If we move on to the uh, final slide, uh, please. So in conclusion, um, maintenance recaparib significantly improved progression-free survival on the aerial free trial versus uh, placebo um, in uh, the, the whole uh, trial uh, population, irrespective of their prior therapy. So it improved uh, those patients with a, a, a progression-free interval to penultimate platinum of six to less than equal to 12 months or more than 12 months. Those who received two or more than uh, or equal to three prior chemotherapy regimens and those who had or had not received prior bevacizumab. And the magnitude of PFS improvement measured by hazard ratio was similar across all subgroups and in the different analysis cohorts. Importantly, we present in the paper that the safety profile, again, was similar across all subgroups and was consistent with other reports. And the additional duration of, of safety data collected um, was important and showed that no new safety signals were identified uh, without additional follow-up. So taken together, uh, the results that we present in this paper demonstrate the consistent efficacy and safety of recaparib maintenance treatment, even in patients who are more heavily pretreated and or have more rapid disease uh, recurrence, provided they have uh, platinum uh, sensitive uh, disease. Thank you. Well, great. Thank you very much, Andrew. That was really a fantastic presentation. Thank you for uh, um, targeting all the uh, main points of the, of the study. Um, and obviously, we like to hear from you on a number of uh, questions that our fellows have uh, prepared. Um, I also like to encourage the audience that through the chat, um, they can also submit their questions directly to Andrew or, or uh, questions for discussion. So we look forward to um, receiving those questions as well. So the, um, the first question, Andrew, is going to come from um, Emma. Uh, Emma, I believe, uh, is way in the middle of the night for her in uh, Australia. So Emma Allison is going to ask uh, her first question. Thank you, Pedro. Good morning from Australia, Dr. Clamp. Um, ovarian cancer, as you know, is increasing in its incidence in lower and middle income countries. And if we have data that PARP inhibitors are effective as single agents um, in different scenarios, and this may make treatment more accessible in resource limited settings, what steps do you think we need to take to increase access to treatment in these settings? Okay, I mean, I think that's a, that's a really um, important question. And I think, you know, in terms of taking that into account, we, we need to, to remember that, that PARP inhibitors are high cost uh, drugs, certainly in, in my country, in, in, in the UK, a, a month's treatment with a, with a PARP inhibitor list price is about 6,000 US uh, uh, dollars. Um, so I think that's certainly something that we need to take into mind when we consider whether we can use these as therapy. Um, instead of chemotherapy rather than as, as maintenance. I think we also need to look at what clinical data we have to support that. And, and the trials that have, have been published really suggest that that's probably only an option with equivalent or, or, or better efficacy in those patients that have BRCA mutated uh, disease, be that germline or, or, or somatic uh, BRCA, BRCA mutated disease. And we, we've got data from Alaprib and, and, and for Acaprib, comparing um, those drugs against uh, uh, chemotherapy um, in, in, in randomized uh, uh, trials. Um, we've also got 
broader data from the NRGG Y004 trial in platinum sensitive recurrent high grade cirrus ovarian cancer that was, was presented at ASCO by Joyce Liu um, last uh, year. And that randomized patients to platinum doublet chemotherapy versus alaparib versus a combination of sidronib um, and, and alaparib. Um, and it certainly showed equivalent or potentially better efficacy for combinations to do in a, a laparib or a laparib versus chemotherapy in, in the germline BRCA mutated uh, population. But single agent laparib seemed inferior in the germline BRCA uh, wild type uh, uh, population. So I think the key factor to take in mind is really, I, I suppose, negotiating with, with pharma potentially to reduce the cost of these uh, medications, but also making sure that they're, they're targeted to the right uh, patient group. I think if we're using it as, as, as therapy, that probably needs to be those patients who've got a, a, a deleterious BRCA uh, mutation driving their, their malignancy. Great. Um, well, thank you, uh, Andrew. And uh, the next uh, question comes from uh, Ceci Darin from uh, Argentina. Uh, but I think that uh, before her question, there's a poll and particularly relevant to the point that you were uh, bringing up with regards to BRCA mutation. So, uh, Ceci? Hi, hello. Thank you, Dr. Clamp. Uh, yes, I would like to start with a poll question for the audience. Um, the idea is to, to understand which is the status of approval for PARP inhibitors in recurrent ovarian cancer in your region. I still don't see the, the poll. Oh, here it is. So which is the, the status of approval for PARP inhibitors in recurrent ovarian cancer in your region? Do you use it with BRCA mutant, uh, HRD, BRC day or HRD is not required or you don't have access or approval for PARP inhibitors? Okay, so let's wait for a second. Okay, so uh, apparently 40% of the audience um, uh, don't uh, ask for BRC or HID. They can uh, use PARP inhibitors. 30% uh, requires a BRCA mutant and HRD in 9%, and 22% uh, don't have access to PARP inhibitors or approval. Okay, so um, now to my question. Is, um, so if you have the possibility of choosing between any PARP inhibitors, which one would you choose? And for first line maintenance uh, treatment or for a uh, recurrent ovarian cancer? Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks. Thanks, Maria. So, I mean, if we, if we take uh, the recurrent uh, disease setting uh, first, I mean, I, I think I would say, you know, the efficacy that we see from randomized uh, clinical trials really sort of indicates that all PARP inhibitors are, are probably very similar um, in, in their clinical efficacy. I mean, I think it's very unlikely that we're going to get head-to-head -head trials uh, comparing uh, these uh, uh, drugs. So I, I really think it it depends on you know which drugs that you're familiar with uh, using. Um, the cytoprec profiles are slightly different uh, between the, the, the treatments. You know we see more myelosuppression, particularly thrombocytopenia, with uh, niraparib. So that requires a bit more careful monitoring during the first month or two of, of, of treatment. But you know once patients established on. Um, uh, their tolerable uh, uh, dose, um, things are, are, are sort of relatively uh, simple from that point of view. Rucaparib does cause a reversible transaminitis, again, during the first month or so of, of, of treatment. So particularly if you've got patients who do have abnormal LFTs or you might be concerned about hepatic toxicity, that might not be um, the best option. I mean, in terms of longer term toxicities, the incidence of, of anemia um, and, and probably um, MDS is, is, is similar across um, all drugs. In the first line uh, setting, 
um, you know, we have to think about what what approvals that, that we have in terms of what drugs that 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 are available. So we've got sort of maintenance, single agent, um, alaparib approved for BRCA mutated uh, disease. Niraparib is pr approved more broadly for stage three and four, um, high grade cirrus and, and endometroid ovarian uh, cancer. And then we've, of course, we've now got the combination of bevacizumab and alaparib approved on the, the back of the Paola one uh, data in, in patients who've got homologous recombination uh, deficient um, uh, disease. I mean, in our practice recently, we have had HRD testing available to us funded by the National Health Service in uh, the UK. And so all our patients are being tested up front uh, with that. Um, what I tend to do um, in patients who are homologous recombination deficient, I would offer those patients bevacizumab and alaparib unless there's a contraindication uh, to bevacizumab. With the proviso that you know those patients who've got a germline BRCA2 mutation who we know do exceptionally well with single agent PARP inhibitors, we would have a discussion about just using single agent alaparib um, versus the combination treatment in in that group. In patients who are homologous recombination uh, proficient, although niraparib is licensed, we know the magnitude or the, of, of improvement in median progression-free survival is relatively limited for, for that group. So if that patient is already established on maintenance bevacizumab, we would generally continue uh, with that and save the PARP inhibitor for uh, recurrent uh, disease. And those who are not on uh, maintenance bevacizumab, we would have a, a detailed discussion with the patient of the pros and cons of starting uh, niraparib. Great. Thank you very much, Andrew. And actually, before we go on to the next question, I kind of wanted to just hear your thoughts uh, regarding that poll that um, almost a, a quarter have no access to PARP inhibitors. Does that surprise you that you know, almost 25% of people uh, don't have access to a PARP inhibitor? So, uh, I mean, I suppose I, I know your, your fellows come from, you know, a broad uh, range of, of, of countries uh, and incomes across the world. So it probably doesn't surprise me that there is a, a proportion, you know, I'm sure it's for economic constraints that don't have, have PARP inhibitor access. And, you know, that is something as a, as a global community, we probably need to, to work to try and change at least for uh, those patients that have got BRCA mutated disease. All right, so I uh, I think the next uh, the next question comes from Sarah Nasser, who is uh, in uh, Germany now. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Pedro, and thank you, Dr. Klam. Um, just thinking about the past year and a half, the COVID pandemic has had implications on the management of patients with gynae malignancies, and there have been various international and multicentric surveys that have shown a shift in. Uh, to new adjuvant chemotherapy treatment in patients with primary ovarian cancer, especially during the early phases of the pandemic. So in view of this, and maybe with the thought of a future risk management strategy during pandemics, and considering the potential use of PARP inhibitors in low and middle income countries, what is your opinion, Dr. Clamp, on the role of PARP inhibitors in the new adjuvant setting, either as a single agent or in combination with chemotherapy? Okay, so I think that's an interesting uh, question but i think at the moment it, it, it's really a question that we should be um addressing in 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 our clinical uh, research mm -hmm. um certainly substituting a, a parp inhibitor for platinum based uh, chemotherapy in the neoadjuvant setting i think you know it, it could potentially be a, a risky strategy for, for for many many patients so i think we probably need to establish its efficacy and sort of window of opportunity studies potentially initially in, in, in the BRCA uh, mutated uh, population before we think about adopting that more widely. In terms of combining a PARP inhibitor with uh, chemotherapy, we know that's sort of proven difficult, at least with conventional sort of three-weekly carboplatin and, and, and taxol. Um, it was shown to be feasible and safe with viliparib in, in the VELIA trial, but obviously viliparib is not a drug that 
that's available to us. And it was unclear what benefit that combination um, component of the treatment gave over and above just transitioning to maintenance treatment at the end of, 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 of chemotherapy. And there was certainly sort of greater hematological uh, toxicity. I mean, I'm aware that there is a, a trial that's ongoing that's looking at a Laprib with weekly carbotaxel in the neoadjuvant setting, but that's just a small um, single arm phase two trial um, looking at um, efficacy, particular sort of looking at histological uh, response to the interval surgical specimen alongside safety. So I, I think that's probably something for our ongoing uh, research rather than something that we could consider transitioning uh, to um, at, at present. Great. So our next uh, question comes from uh, Guatemala, Eric Estrada. Thanks, sir, Dr. Clamp. Um, do you have data for some clinically significant improvement benefit relatively to that? So I think Eric had a, a, a poor connection oh. to the uh, to the internet. I'll reread the question. Do you have data on the quality of life uh, patient's oh. perception of clinical significant improvement benefit relative to side effects? Yeah, so I mean, I mean patient reported outcomes um, were uh, collected um, in all the sort of phase three trials looking at uh, maintenance PARP inhibition, so aerial three, um, solo to um, NOVA studies. And, you know, they don't show a clinically significant deterioration in quality of life in patients that have maintenance PARP inhibition. I think the difficulty is that the tools we've got at the moment aren't particularly sensitive for the use of maintenance uh, treatments. They tend to focus on symptoms related to disease and acute chemotherapy um, toxicity. I mean, people have started to look at more sophisticated models, sort of Q-twist modeling, which is looking at the duration of time without symptoms of disease or treatment-related uh, toxicity. Um, and those data do show, you know, benefits from, from, from maintenance PARP inhibition, but they do point out that, you know, patients do have periods of, of, of time, you know, maybe several months during their maintenance treatments where they do have um, symptomatic toxicity from from treatment, um, be that generally mild to moderate fatigue or, or nausea. All right, great, very much. Thank you, Andrew. And then our next uh, uh, question comes from uh, Arthur in Taiwan, that is also accompanied by a uh, Paul. So uh, thank you, Dr. Clampo. We're we're going to start with a, a poll. poll. Uh, so, uh, given that in some re regions uh, you don't need a BRCA or HRD test to start PARP inhibitor, we are curious that uh, do you routinely perform BRCA HRD test pr prior to commencing PARP inhibitor? Uh, yes or no? <clears throat> and now for our answers, uh, results. So 84% of our participants uh, routinely perform BRCA HRD test prior to commencing PARP inhibitor and 16% don't do that. So um, given that there are many different kits uh, available for testing for HRD, uh, Dr. Clamp, uh, my question is uh, that, uh, do you believe that in the future there will be standardization of HRD tests given that they have a different methodology for different kits. Uh, uh, do you believe that in the future there will be standardization? Why or why not? And thank you so much. Yeah, no, no, um, absolutely. Um, you know, there's a huge translational research effort uh, going on to develop um, an academic uh, test uh, to evaluate homologous uh, recombination uh, deficiency. I mean, I mean, currently, we, we need to bear in mind that, you know, the companion diagnostic for first line use of bevacizumab or Laprib is the Myriad My Choice um, assay, but both that and, and the foundation medicine assay that, that are available, you know, are looking for genomic uh, scarring. Um, and so, yes, that is a, a, a marker of homologous recombination. Uh, deficiency, but it's it's sort of a, a permanent marker. So it you know 
the presence of that will not change with time if a patient develops PARP inhibitor resistance during their during their their illness. And I think that's really why we need to to look at more um, sort of <laughs> definitive markers of, of of HRD that may give us an, an idea of exactly what the PARP inhibitor sensitivity is at the point when we're considering. Uh, commencing uh, those uh, treatments. I mean, there's certainly work uh, showing that in patients who've got BRCA mutations, we often see BRCA reversion uh, mutations during PARP inhibitor treatment or platinum-based uh, chemotherapy, and we know that renders a patient, you know, completely resistant uh, to PARP inhibitor um, exposure. So I think over over the next few years, the likelihood is that more sophisticated uh, tests will be developed. Hopefully, they'll come from academia so that they will be uh, more um, appropriately uh, priced and, and, more, and more widely available. But but currently, um, certainly in the first line setting, I, I think we are um, stuck with using the Myriad My Choice assay. All right. And our uh, uh, subsequent question comes from uh, Natalia uh, Rodriguez, who is in Spain. Thank you, Pedro, and um, thank you, Dr. Clam. So, well, uh, given your wonderful results of the current study, are you planning to design another prospective randomized trial to improve the design of the study? Um, for instance, the number of prior chemotherapy and prior bevacizumab. Um, could you share currently ongoing projects that you are working on in regarding the PARP inhibitors? Thank you, uh, and Natalia. So, so it's in response to the first part of, of, of your question. We're not sort of actively planning an, another uh, trial evaluating recaprib as, as, as a maintenance treatment in platinum-sensitive uh, recurrent um, ovarian cancer. But, but I think there are lots of important uh, research uh, questions that, that we need to address. Some of them are being addressed by trials that are ongoing um, at the moment. Um, I think, you know, the, the key clinical uh, questions are about, you know, during a, a patient's illness, would they benefit from more than one exposure to a, a PARP inhibitor in the maintenance uh, setting? I mean, I think clearly we don't have sufficient evidence to recommend that currently. We need to await the results of, of, of clinical trials that are ongoing, particularly the OREO trial. But I think another important question that might be ripe uh, for looking at it is, is around duration of, of PARP inhibitor exposure. I mean, particularly with the emerging safety signal of, of MDS AML, especially in, in, in women who carry a, a germline BRCA uh, mutation, taking the data from the, from the first line setting, it may be that we could consider a study looking at a, a you know, a fixed duration of, of, of maintenance um, a PARP inhibitor in, in, in a recurrent setting, you know, maybe maybe two years as was, was looked at in um, Solo One compared to sort of ongoing treatment. We know about 15% of patients who've entered into, with BRCA mutation, entered into trials of recurrent, um, with recurrent disease are still on a PARP inhibitor at, at five, five years. So I think, you know, that's um, an important question, sort of de-escalation of duration of treatment does that does that affect efficacy and does that reduce the incidence of serious long-term uh, toxicity? And then I think sort of moving beyond that, you know, as well as asking questions about combinations with other targeted treatments such as immunotherapy, and we've got lots of trials waiting to report that have completed accrual um, that have addressed that that question. I think other looking at other sort of novel combinations to try and get around PARP inhibitor resistance or broaden um, efficacy of PARP inhibitor in patients who've got BRCA wild type uh, disease. Um, I think it is going to be important, you know, people are looking at the combination of serolacertib and a TR inhibitor with a laparib or um, a pelisib, a PI3 kinase um, inhibitor, and there are uh, trials that are, that are ongoing looking, looking at that. And, you know, there are new generation PARP inhibitors coming through early phase developments that are, are more focused at inhibiting part one rather than part one and part two, which all the conventional drugs do currently, you know, and that may improve the therapeutic uh, window of these drugs. Well, great. Thank you uh, so much, Andrew. And uh, I think that actually there's a there's a subsequent question. I think it's, a, it's also a really good question from uh, 
Ceci Darin in, in Argentina. And I don't know, Ceci, if you want to ask you the question uh, and, um, and uh, proceed. Okay, thank you. My question would be, is what do you think will happen in the future with PARP inhibitors in recurrent ovarian cancer with the increasing use in first line? So I think, and I think that's all going to depend, I think, on the results of potentially the, the OREO trial, which is looking at PARP inhibitor uh, re retreatment. I mean, it, it depends whether we get a, a, a positive signal from that study. If we do, then, you know, we may consider using more than one line of maintenance PARP inhibitor. If that trial is, 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 is negative, then I, I think we will be using PARP inhibitors more up front, particularly in the, the BRCA mutated uh, population. Um, and then we will need to think about, you know, are there, as I say, novel combinations that we can use uh, for subsequent uh, maintenance uh, treatment beyond the next line of platinum-based treatments. Great. And um, Andrew, actually, I'll, I'll ask you, I'll take advantage of, uh, of you as a, a, a consultant now. A patient that came to see us recently, she had neoadjuvant chemotherapy, um, six cycles, complete response, um, imaging and pathologically and serologically uh, at the time of interval surgery uh, after the six cycles. Um, she was BRCA negative, but no unknown status of HRD. So she had not had bevacizumab, she just had carbo and taxol, BRCA negative. Um, what part would you use with her? So, I mean, I think in terms of uh, where we are with with, with current approvals, um, you know, Nirapra will be the drug that would be um, available uh, uh, for her um, on the basis of the Prima uh, trial. Okay, okay. great. Uh, and I think uh, Arthur has a, a question regarding uh, patients with uh, platinum sensitivity. Um, go ahead, Arthur, do you want to ask a question? Yeah, thank you, Pedro. Um, uh, Dr. Clamp, I have this question. So for a patient with recurrent ovarian cancer, having platinum, uh, uh, she's platinum sensitive, uh, would you re recommend her to start platinum chemotherapy again, followed by a PARP inhibitor, just as at Ario 3, Nova, or Solo 2? Or would you recommend her to do Solo 3? Just uh, forget about the chemotherapy, uh, just to start uh, PARP inhibitor uh, uh, directly. Yeah. Thank you. Right. So, I mean, in our practice, we would give platinum-based uh, uh, chemotherapy, establish sensitivity to that, and then give a, a maintenance PARP inhibitor at that at that point in time. And that's, I suppose, in part driven by the availability of PARP inhibitors within the, the UK. We don't have them available for therapy, we only have them available as maintenance uh, uh, treatment. I suppose if she had a, a BRCA mutation, then you could make an argument for giving her um, a PARP inhibitor up front as treatment rather than uh, maintenance. But I, I think you would just need to have the, the discussion uh, with her on the, you know, the evidence base uh, for that. And if she was keen to avoid chemotherapy, I think that would be entirely reasonable. Very well. Well, um, I don't know if there are any uh, additional questions or from our audience. If there are not, then uh, we're coming up to the 40 minutes. So I want to thank, uh, first of all, all of the fellows for um, putting their questions together. I want to thank also Andrew. Uh, for his uh, time, his uh, commitment to the to the journal club, and uh, and all the 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 uh, you know time that was dedicated in preparation for for the journal club and for submitting your paper to our journal, and obviously for the contributions you're making with this very interesting work. So thank you so much, Andrew. Thank you to the fellows. I want to thank everyone who uh, joined in and, and uh, participated, uh, and then always to the uh, support team. And uh, I uh, just now uh, see the announcement for the next Journal Club, August 10th on Tuesday on minimally invasive hysterectomy, stage 1A cervical cancer uh, by Dimitrios Nasioudis. Uh, that should be also a very interesting uh, uh, Journal Club looking at whether the minimally invasive approach 
may be considered in very, very low risk patients. So with that, uh, thank you all. Thank you very much for, uh, for joining and we look forward to seeing you next time.